Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our June 20th meeting of the Academic Affairs Committee of the School Board of Directors. Uh, Dr. Etlin, are you okay for me to get started? Excellent. Thanks, everybody, for being here. We do have a busy end of the year agenda this evening. As you can see, we are joined by a number of extra panelists, um, representatives from our high school. We're going to spend some time this evening talk about uh, curriculum related items. We have curriculum map documents to review with um, you for courses that we're planning to offer next year. Uh, Dr. Van Voren is going to share with us her proposals um, from her department for the special education plan to be in line with the Pennsylvania Department of Education submission timelines for that uh, plan that gets completed every three years. Dr. Van Voren and I are also gonna provide some updates to our summer programs that are happening on campus. It's already a very busy place here. Um, and then we'll talk a little before we wrap up on things you can look forward to when we come back together in the fall. Um, and then certainly we'll have any public comments, should there be any, and then any questions or comments from this group. Okay, that being said, let's get started. So I have some curriculum related uh, updates and items. I appreciate Dr. Scragan and Dr. Rittenhouse for being with us also, as well as the department coordinators. I'm gonna start um, in the social studies department. We have, count them, five new courses for you to review this evening. Um, Mrs. Fosarelli, are you okay if I provide a little bit of context and overview and then take questions from your end? Does that work for you? Okay. Yes. Uh, so the first of these classes is street law. I'm hoping when I share my, am I still sharing my screen in a document's opening? Excellent. I was afraid that it would not. Um, our street law course is one of our new electives. I'll remind you that when we get to civics, that this year that's in all these are elective, ex including civics for the coming year. Beginning next year, the following school year, 23, 24, it will be a required course. But right now it's still an elective. Um, offsetting that half credit course in the senior, junior or senior year is a street law course. You'll see that these are our new curriculum framing documents. These are the documents that will be posted on our website. Just to orient our board members, you'll remember that we really wanted to try going forward to align our profile of a graduate and the <clears throat> focus skills and concepts as the critical components to designing these courses. So our teachers created the uh, course description, the overarching essential questions, the major units of studies for these courses, and then each course has components of critical thinking, communication, problem solving, self-motivated learner, and global citizen. Again, what's most essential in our new courses and as we continue to refine our prior courses is finding ways to build those, pro uh, those, those lifelong skills as a key design element of the classes. So uh, in this particular course, we're helping students to navigate the space uh, between understanding uh, law and crime, criminal justice. Mrs. Fosarelli, did I get it all? I believe so. Um, any questions or comments on street law from the members of the board? Okay, moving right along. Our next course is um, it, the, the opposite course of African-American studies is an ethnic studies course. This course is um, intended to provide a holistic approach to understanding, let's see, <laughs> got all the comments were out. Uh, <laughs> um, understanding the way in which uh, students experience through multiple perspectives, history and social interaction through the lens of ethnicity. And so again, as we did before, the essential questions for the course are here really examining identity and experience and perspectives and how those experiences and perspectives shape our understanding of historical events. I did share these with the board members of our board of school directors over the weekend, so I knew it was a lot to digest, but um, I don't wanna to try to read through it, but I do know you had the opportunity to look at it and I know you'll ask us any questions should you have them. Ashley, anything you wanna add about this course? I don't think so. Anybody else, questions, comments, or concerns? Okay. Economics. 
an exciting addition to our high school course offering. I know we're excited about this one. Um, looking at decision-making, incentives, society, um, and understanding the ways in which trade, both locally and internationally, impacts sort of the decisions that we make. Questions or comments? And last, but oh no, excuse me, still two. Ah, history and film. This is the one we're most excited about, I think. This is the one that we've got like some real excitement from the department about is really um, understanding for lifelong learners the idea that film um, is informed by historical events and situations and that we need to be, students need the lifelong skill of being um, good consumers and viewers of the content around them asking additional questions. Ashley, anything else? No, there's a, a lot of buzz around this one, both with students and the, the staff. This was the first to fill up, Dr. Z, is that right? Of our new electives, this was definitely the most popular. <laughs> Any questions? Okay. Then last but not least is our high school civics course. <clears throat> Same thing, we really tried to build some essential questions that are broader than particular content and instead getting the students to ask the questions that will help them think about um, this content in the lens of their life and after they leave us after high school. So really recognizing the way they can take action and be engaged in civic government. For example, we've talked about them coming to a board meeting and observing this kind of public experience. So if all of a sudden we see a lot of students showing up, they may be taking our civics course. <laughs> Ashley, anything I missed? Um, I don't think so. We're just really excited, you know, to have the ability to offer such a robust electives um, program now. Um, so thank you all very much for, you know, increasing the part-time position to a full-time and for allowing us to, to pilot and run with these courses. We are excited to, you know, I think there's a thread of, just making our students better decision makers across the board, whether it's psych as an individual or sociology as a member of a group or civics as a, a US citizen and economics as a consumer and you know, seeing ourselves and our roles um, and, and then having the skill set to go out and do something with it. I think we're just really looking forward to getting these up and running. You will realize or recognize that there are no textbook adoption requests for social studies at this time. Um, Mrs. Fossarelli and her team and um, the high school administration and I have agreed that for the first year for these courses, we'll be selecting um, resources and materials that make sense from an eclectic uh, array of options. Um, we may or may not come back to this group later next year or the, going into the following year with a recommendation for our particular textbook. But given the dynamic nature of this and how quickly some of the information changes and how much we want it grounded in the students themselves and their experience, um, we believe that at this time it makes the most sense to not be um, tied into one text series. Um, so that we may be back for that later. Any final questions or comments about social studies? Uh, yes, I have a question. Um, Moving forward with this exciting list of new course options, for, am I correct in my understanding that the first year will be, uh, these will be electives, and then moving forward beyond, um, it will then morph into uh, something that the students will be able to, um, to sign up on a regular basis as part of their social studies. Am I correct on that? Civics will be a required course mm -hmm. going forward, and the others are electives. Okay, all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. But all of these, these five courses are all being offered at some point next year, pending your approval this evening. Okay, thank you. Dr. Johnson, if I could just, um, Dr. Ellen, I'm not sure if you were on the board um, prior, um, previously when I was in the role that Dr. Johnson holds right now, but when we had revised the six through 12 social studies course sequence, one of the decisions we made um, and the department made was that there was an interest in offering some flexibility for the senior course requirement. And so we are shifting um, when we add civics as a requirement, that is a half credit. That'll be half of the senior year requirement. 
And then these four electives are among a list of electives that students can take to marry up to civics in order to meet their senior year social studies graduation requirement. Okay, thank you, Dr. Yanaga. That gave me a lot more context. Thank you again. Absolutely. Thanks, Dr. Yanaka. Thanks, Mrs. Fosarelli. Uh, congratulations again to you. The members of the Academic Affairs uh, Group may not know. Ashley has stepped in as our new social studies department coordinator at the high school. This is literally her first two weeks on the job doing this task. <laughs> Some people might call it hazing, not me, but some people might. She's done a great job. So I'm I, happy to help. I appreciate it. It's been great collaborating so far. So yes. thank you very much for being here tonight. Okay. Thank you. Next up is our physical education course. Uh, this group was not able to attend with us this evening, but I know that Dr. Z and Dr. Rittenhouse and I can try to represent this course. One of the things that we do know is that we have so many students in our district, as you're aware, who are interested in um, their passion for sports and athletics and trying to frame an understanding how physical education, sports and athletic actually can provide an, a venue into a career. And so this course is a proposed um, opportunity <clears throat> to bring together sports management and sports medicine um, to help students get some basic understanding as why that might be a career path for them given, them, given their interest in sports and athletics um, and management. So it's pulling those things together. So again, this is really looking at how might my passion for sports lead to a career um, what are the management functions critical to the success of an organization? And how do you apply critical thinking and emergency response into a career? So taking those ideas, and this course will have units of study in sports management, sports medicine, and of course, first aid, CPR, and AED. Questions, comments, or concerns on this one? Great, thank you. Next up, Mr. McCaslin and our math department. Um, we have two new courses to bring to you today and a textbook adoption, which hot off the presses in the last 10 minutes, the new quote came in for those resources. So I do have that information, Dr. Yannickson, for you. Um, our new business math course. Um, I think we've talked about in this group and when we brought you the concept of the course was to really diversify mathematics and make it accessible to students with all kinds of interests in math and future career planning options. And so this particular course takes a <clears throat> understanding of their the learning from our students and builds on that, but makes it uh, applicable in life after high school. Mr. McCaslin, did I say that in a way that was what you wanted? I think you nailed it perfectly. Okay, is there anything I missed? No, I think, you know, the other piece is just an, an alternate path um, outside of that traditional algebra one, algebra two calculus path. We want to start to create an alternate path for students um, that is more applicable, as you said. So we're excited to bring that course to fruition next year, pending your approval, of course. Any questions or concerns? Next is a concepts of geometry course. You may know that we have a concepts of algebra or algebraic concepts course, level one and two, um, for mathematics learners um, who have an IEP. Every time I think we just get rid of all the comments, they pop back up, I'm sorry. <clears throat> um, mathematics learners who need more practical and hands-on applications of this abstract math concepts. And so uh, Mrs. Borgman and Mr. McCaslin have created a proposed concepts of geometry course for those students. Um, this is a course that is limited to those students who have an IEP or are recommended for placement in the course. Mr. McCaslin, is that right? Perfect. Okay. Any questions around concepts of geometry? And Mr. McCaslin, am I correct that for both business math and concepts of geometry that at this time, we're not ready to make a recommendation for a textbook? Um, yeah, we're gonna resource um, for the business math. Um, we, we have a framework that we like. Um, so we're gonna resource there. Um, 
sort of holistically. And then the concepts of geometry, again, we're going to utilize our envisions text as our core text, um, but things will be differentiated uh, appropriately. Um, but we do, we already have possession of the text that we would use um, for the concepts of geometry. So there's no textbook recommendations at this time for these two courses, so pending yeah. your approval for the two courses. Questions around the two new courses that we're offering? Okay to go. Mr. McCaslin's department, um, during our review last year, some of you were with us last year when we did an extensive mathematics project at the high school where we adopted new Algebra 1, Geometry, Algebra 2, and Pre-Calc materials. Um, in that discussion, we had initially intended to talk about academic statistics as the final material that needed to be revised to create a more accessible, more student-centric resource. At that time, we were not, we ran out of time before coming into the school year and the team wanted to talk some more after we launched the other materials. That has happened and the team has brought forward a recommendation for an academic statistics textbook, elementary statistics um, from Pearson, which is really Savas, who also uh, provides our resources in algebra, geometry, um, and pre-calculus. So we are uh, recommending that to you. There was a team of folks who did so. Mr. McCaslin, can you say why this is the text you ultimately, I know you looked at three different texts, why this is the one you chose? Um, the approachability of it was much different. It's kind of tricky with the statistics book, finding one that's not written toward the AP exam, but finding the accessibility that we want for a non-AP student who's taking a statistics course. Um, the approachability of this, the variety of problems, the real world application of everything that they're presenting. Uh, it was just hands down the right fit for our student population. Um, transitioning from our much, much, much older textbook that we had, it does have some of the similarities that we liked, um, but the biggest thing was the accessibility and, and the the, yeah, I mean, the way it was written, I guess for, for no other, uh, no other way to put it. Thanks, Mr. McCaslin. And that quote did come in this afternoon um, after we had already sort of gotten ready for today. Um, and for the purchase of 40 student digital and hard copy texts and a teacher edition with a six year license comes in at $9,865.66. So that is our recommend where um, there is a motion on the board agenda for tomorrow evening for approval pending the recommendation from this committee. Any questions for Mr. McCaslin and R.I. or Bound Mathematics? Can I ask a question? And I hope it's not a dumb one. So there currently is not an academic statistics, right? It's just AP stat? Um, there is an academic statistics. We've had that for quite some time. Okay. Um, we're, we're really functioning out of a 25-year-old okay. textbook at the moment. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, so this is just to replace that textbook. Right. Yeah. Okay. This is the same, but the we're updating the resource. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Sure. Amy, if I can just give a little bit of context as well, this is going way back before my time. When the math department um, under the previous assistant superintendent, previous to me, assistant superintendent, was undergoing curriculum review a decision was made to just go K-8 because they were adopting Envisions and they wanted to see what was gonna happen in adopting that new program and how that might change what would be needed at the secondary, at the high school level. So when that happened, when I came, arrived, uh, Corey was very um, quick and, and he was a strong advocate for his department to say, we lost out on being part of that curriculum cycle and we really like to get back to a review of the high school math curriculum. And he was right to do so because most of the textbooks were well out of date um, and the department was ready for some change. So these courses are sort of the back end of what we were in the midst of pre-pandemic. Um, and we had started with some courses where we had to update texts like AP Statistics and AP Calc, um, but we really wanted to make sure that we finished the cycle. So it's taken a little while 
Corey's been very patient, so has his department, and so has the high school team. Um, but we've gotten there under Dr. Johnston. Mr. McCaslin, anything else you want to add? Um, no, I'm, I'm good. Okay. Mr. Franco, were you going to say something? Yeah, can I just, when we talk about the life of the textbook, I, I mean, I understand 25 years is, uh, sounds like a, a very, very, very long time. Um, but just looking at this one where there's a six-year license, I assume that's for the digital component. Like, how often should we be updating textbooks for, um, for a class like this? Like, what would, what would a norm be? Usually it's around six to eight years. Okay. Eight, eight on the long end. Six is right on schedule. Um, so what we're finding is that we're most, everything we've adopted in the last year since I've been in the role has been with six year licenses. So it aims to keep us on track. Okay. Um, the nice part about those digital licenses is as, less in mathematics and more in some of our other subject areas, as there are updates or shifts, the digital materials are, shift, are changed immediately. Um, it's okay. the textbook, the, tech, the hard copy book that then is out of date in the, that six years. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Mr. McCaslin, for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. And certainly, last but not least, is my favorite department, the music department, with their two new exciting courses, piano and keyboarding and digital music production. So let's talk about piano and keyboarding first. Dr. Rittenhouse sneak a comment in here since the last time I checked. Nope. <clears throat> so uh, the music department is recommending that we add this course, um, piano and keyboarding. Um, it's a direct instruction on the piano and keyboard. Is that right, Mr. Gosman? That is correct in a classroom setting, uh, but yes, individual instruction on keyboard instruments. So it's an exciting addition to our music program. Um, and again, trying to figure out how to give students that opportunity for lifelong skills that will stay with them after they leave high school. Questions or comments about that? Put it on the screen, okay. And the other course, um, Digital music production. Mr. Gottesman, do you want to talk about that one a little bit? Because I think it's really exciting what you all have in mind and what you've proposed. Sure. Uh, digital music production is, is an increasingly more popular major uh, at colleges. Um, even some of our local schools have been, uh, you know, growing their music offerings by offering this technology element, including Drexel University is, is really one of the schools that has really sort of grabbed onto not only music technology, but also the business of music. And uh, because so many people are now able to be producers of their own in their, in their basement or even in their bedroom, uh, with the technology that's available in everyone's pocket and on their computers, uh, now students are able to develop very, very sophisticated productions on their own. And this aims uh, to reach out to those students who have a, an existing interest in that, as well as uh, sort of showing the students the resources that are available uh, if they want to develop that skill. So this is an exciting course offering. It's, uh, you know, very 21st century. And uh, I think a lot of the students are real excited that we're going to be offering it. Thanks, Mr. Gottesman. So again, this is the last music course that we're hoping to offer next fall pending approval from this, this team. Any questions or comments about our music recommendations? Dr. Rittenhouse, Dr. Scraken, do you have any additional comments? I just have one uh, to make. Thank you uh, for inviting me tonight. Uh, with regards to the digital musical product, music production, that was also going to be a uh, dual enrollment with Montgomery County Community College, where students could pay a fee and actually get college credit while they're still in high school. Thanks, so Dr. Yeah, that that part. That's important. Thank you. Yeah, we also <laughs> have the alignment already written with uh, Montgomery County Community College. That is important. And I'd also like to say to the members of the board that Andrew Pontel has worked very hard uh, to make that connection and to uh, make, make that a reality. 
And I'd, I'd like to thank the curriculum leadership team, uh, Dr. J, Dr. Z, all the department uh, chairs, department coordinators, K through 12. It, it, it's a pretty, not simple, but a pretty concise two page document. And there's a ton of work that has gone into that. So I, I appreciate everybody's efforts. Me too. We're hopeful that our members of our school board um, see our commitment to our profile of a graduate and the way to bring that forward in our class and in, in real life to our classrooms and to our students. Um, not just an image on a picture or uh, on a piece of paper, but really changing the way in which we're designing instruction in our schools. Um, Damien, I would say as a mom of high school students, I'm like super jealous that they get to take all these courses. And I really do appreciate what I can see, the time and energy that went into, you know, creating these courses and looking at the big picture, you know, even what you were just saying about the digital music production and connecting that with getting college credit for it. So I, I can tell a lot of hard work went into this. And as somebody who will, my kids will soon reap the benefits. I appreciate that. Thanks, Mrs. Hughley. Great. All right. Um, last but not least, thanks, Mr. Gottesman for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you all very much. Have a good evening. Take care. The last item I put on the agenda for all of you was just to review that um, <clears throat> given that, as you may be aware, we've had a number of questions come forward at some of our school board meetings around how we select library resources. And so I wanted just to make sure that we, you knew that we had a procedure internally that aligns to policy 109, which is our supplemental materials policy, um, about how we go about um, reviewing thinking about and adding to or updating our collection. And so uh, I have linked that for you in this document today. Um, and that the librarians call together their recommendations and then through recommendations to their building principals, make requests for purchases. They review them. They ultimately move up the chain for approval. Um, but nothing is just decided by any one librarian on their own. So I just wanted to make sure we had talked about it, given that it has come up regularly in our meetings. Um, I thought it might be helpful to make sure that you knew we had a process and a procedure and that our libra librarians reviewed it again this year when we revised policy 109, just to make sure we were in line. Any questions or concerns around the library process? I just want to chime in and say that I have zero concerns about any books that uh, our administration and our teachers are selecting. Um, I, I think everything you guys are doing is fantastic and I think it's wonderful that there's such a selection to appeal to all of the learners that we have in our schools um, so keep up the good work please thanks Mr. DeFranco I'll pass that on to our school librarians and I have to echo um, Mr. DeFranco's sentiment um, and additionally I, I see you have mentioned on this particular document where this uh, process or procedure can be found. So if a parent or anyone at a meeting or would raise the question, well, where do I find this? And you would just direct them to policy 109. Am I correct on that? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. All right, with, um, can I assume that all those classes and courses are good to go, that there's no concern from the members of our school board? No concern for me. I think they all sound uh, very exciting and um, super interesting. I, I I wish I had more interesting courses when I was in school, but but yeah, this is this is exciting stuff. The team did spectacular work, and um, it they have been um, open, willing, and excited to really think about how to do this work a little bit differently by shifting the focus to those after life, like life after school outcomes. And so it's really I'm excited to see them come to fruition and get to visit next year when I see them in practice. So thanks for this. These are just some great choices. Um, and I can tell the curriculum folks did a lot of homework to put this together. And I know our students are gonna be excited, um, want to jump into as many of these as they can possibly fit into their schedule, but uh, wonderful, wonderful choices. So I applaud everyone who worked on these. Thanks so much, Dr. Atlin. Yes, I agree. Thanks, Dr. Amy. Johnson, I just wanna make uh, just 30 seconds for the board members as a nuance of this, just to make sure that the public is aware and perhaps Dr. Eitlin in your summary. So you noticed that Dr. Johnston made a point of linking the profile of the graduate. So her work in working with the coordinators has been to shift our focus, which she mentioned a moment ago, but I wanna emphasize um, from content coverage 
to skill development. And that is a shift we are you know, working on across the district, especially at the secondary level, where as you know, sometimes content coverage can take precedence over skill development. So we're working on that. Um, and we know that that's an important um, mindset shift to really help our students be successful beyond Springfield. Thanks, Dr. Yannicka. Moving right along, I'm gonna turn the uh, screen over to Dr. Van Voren so that she can share with us her proposed special education plan. As a clarifying piece, um, as she gets her screen up and shared, uh, we're reviewing it with you all this evening. Um, there's a motion on the board meeting tomorrow night, uh, assuming that you're agreeable for us to do the public posting for 30 days. Um, and then it gets submitted um, at the end of July, beginning of August after our next board meeting. So Dr. Van Voren, with that little intro and buying some time, I'm gonna turn it over to you. It's all been a warm up for this one, folks. So good afternoon. I'm pleased to be here to show you our next three year special education plan. So it would begin, of course, the year of 2022 to 2023 and bring us to the spring of 2025. If in your mind's eye, you can see us getting there already. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started. The special ed plan, my original intent was to use the website. There was a brand new website by PDE this year. So there's a lot of input. It's kind of a wonky website in that it has little highlighted tabs so you can't see the entire draft at one time. So until it's approved, I can't bring it off of the website. So what I did is put a presentation today. You're gonna to see a lot of words on the screen, which I can't stand it when I have to give a presentation and there's lots of words on the screen, but I did that because I'm trying to get as much information to you. I'm gonna highlight some things that are on the screen and then I can share this with you so that you can peruse a little more at your leisure. So we'll go ahead and get started. All right, so there's different areas that the special education plan asks you to highlight. The first is if during any kind of monitoring or any kind of auditing process, is there anything that we need to work on? So pending our last monitoring, there were two areas that we needed to show growth and come up with a plan. So the first one was disproportionate representation by race, ethnicity, and disability. So basically there were students, more students of color were being identified. So that was where looking at our population, we had to take a closer look. So as you can see on the screen here, we're gonna continue working towards this by looking at our MTSS process and really honing in on those particular students and taking a more personal look at their background and the demographics, especially those students that receive EL services to make sure that we are not overrepresenting and, and qualifying them for special education services for what is an English as a second language concern. As you look down here, we're gonna spend some time looking at it from the Equitable Practices Committee. We're gonna be working with our L teachers and our psychologists during the evaluation process. And of course, we're gonna look, um, have the administrative team look at it and look at how the curriculum is faring. Is it culturally relevant and responsive? And are our students responding to that? So that's the first area. The second one had to do with assessment. Some of our special education students are opting out of assessment. So, Damien and I have spoken a lot about this. And this year we had a lot of students come in, at least it seemed like a lot, but it was actually in proportionate to years past. But many of them were parents of special education students concerned with state testing not being appropriate for their children. So looking through this to make sure that we make parents knowledgeable about the process and what is actually contained within these assessments, you'll see that I will work together with the assistant superintendent so that parents have that information. Uh, we will have a focus group for families and students so that we can answer questions and you know, share the importance and the purpose of each of the tests that they are taking part in. We will be looking at participation rates and we will be looking at patterns per building. Does it look like it's primarily an elementary, a middle, a high school? Is it secondary versus elementary? Are there specific students with specific disability categories that are falling into those that most often are pulling out of testing, state testing. 
We're going to create an action plan based on those findings. And then during opt out sessions, when parents come in to meet with Dr. Johnston to go over the assessment before coming up with their reason for not wanting their student to take it, um, being more involved from my office and being a part of those conversations so that parents truly understand the depth of that decision, as well as working with special ed department coordinators at the building level to make sure that the teachers and the administrators and everyone understands that it's just as important for every child to give that, make that attempt to take those assessments. And then we're gonna review at the close of the year to see where we are with it. So this is our plan on those two areas. The next section of the special education plan talks about how we identify students in need of service, so their eligibility. So within our district, we use a discrepancy model. So I put the definition in there in layman's terms, just so they understand that there's a mismatch between the student's intellectual ability and their progress in school. And so because that doesn't match, that student is eligible for special education services. So because disproportionality was flagged, that's something we want to, again, pay attention to when we're looking at the discrepancy model and looking at how many intervention steps we have in place prior to that referral going to the psychologist. Now, I'm sure that many of you heard that this year we did a lot of work within that area in the secondary realm because the middle school put in a flex period at the end of their day where certain days were spent on either remediation or enrichment and the other days were student selected activities and the high school built that flex period in, in the middle of their day so that students could go and meet with teachers, some voluntarily, some not so voluntarily, depending on how they were progressing, just to give them another net and another support for them to succeed. So then, the next section in this plan is our non-resident incarcerated students oversight. So we have one school of which is within this category and it's Carson Valley. So this is a private residential rehabilitation institute that falls within our district boundaries. We work as the LEA for the students within Carson Valley and we help to ensure that FAPE is being delivered to them within special education services, um, with all educational services within the program. Now, recently, Carson Valley is going under a, um, an audit for progress monitoring and, and looking at everything there. And we're kind of in a, um, in a place where the state sees us as the LEA for all students or for the program, and we are seen as the LEA for the student specific. And so the state wants us to be in charge of the audit process, where in fact, we're kind of trying to take a back seat with us so technically, and Damien, you can kind of fill in what I didn't, but we do have our solicitor involved. As Dr. Van Boren mentioned, at another day on another time, we're gonna spend a little bit more time talking about our role with Carson Valley, but we're awaiting some clarification from the Pennsylvania Department of Education and their legal counsel, um, with our legal counsel, sorting out exactly where our role begins and ends. Um, and so Dr. Van Boren and I are mentioning that just so that, that you know that there's more to say but today isn't that day, and this isn't the focus of this particular presentation, but it will be the focus of a different presentation on a different day once we hear back from the Department of Ed. Thanks, Dr. Van Boren. Something to hold on to, something to look forward to. All right, the next section of the plan has to do with the least restrictive environment. Again, I kind of gave you a definition in layman's terms so you would understand that what that means is we use a team approach to make sure that students are placed in students with, in classes with their general education peers as much as possible that benefits those students. So what we do is we always first in, think of inclusion in the homeschool setting. And then if the building is not able to provide the appropriate placement for that student for a variety of reasons, whether it's not therapeutic enough, the emotional support needs of the student are too intense, then we begin looking at outside placements, but we always consider homeschool in the general education class as our first option when we think of least restrictive environment. All right, so with that, there are different categories that we answer to. So the first is universal practices for academic and social and emotional needs. So it talks about what do we have in place to deal with the needs of those students, socially and emotionally, so that they can perform academically. So you'll see here that um, the different levels of schools that we have in the district have different programs. 
So you'll have responsive classroom at Enfield. You have positive behavior support at Erdenheim. And then we morph into using restorative practices and a bit of positive behavior support when we get to the secondary level. We have our second step, a um, research-based program that is targeted for social and emotional learning and providing students with skills to be able to handle different situations in their lives appropriately. We are now have rolled that out to eighth grade. So we are K to eight within that program as it stands. We provide training on de-escalation strategies and crisis prevention to various members of our teams, K to 12. So we have crisis teams within each building, but we did find this year that our secondary aides were benefiting from de-escalation techniques so that they were more equipped to deal with any behavioral interventions or strategies with their students in the classroom. We have started staff professional development on trauma-informed instruction last year. So we'd like to continue on with that. We would like to create more of an awareness of cultural differences. Thus is the work of the Equitable Practices Committee that you're well aware of. And of course, if you don't know, we do have individual outpatient therapy. We currently work with Child and Family Focus and that is available for qualifying students K to 12 where they receive that in the school. Um, and it is year round for students, they can receive that. We also, when we consider least restrictive environment, we look at meaningful participation. So we've provided professional development to our staff so that they can adequately prepare their lessons and their classrooms for students of all needs. We have given them some training on universal design for learning. We've had job embedded professional development, inclusion. We have professional learning communities where we dig into the curriculum and see how we can differentiate content. And then there's training and workshops depending on the person's position. There are flexible learning opportunities that Dr. Johnston had put into place last summer for our staff to be able to seek professional development of interest. We have um, instructional coaches that assist our teachers in the classroom and also making plans or adjusting their schedules to attend to the student needs. And of course, we are continuing to work collaboratively with the Montgomery County Intermediate Units Office of Professional Learning to provide our students with updated training for any certifications they need or for anything new on the fringe. The next section has to do continue on with meaningful participation in extracurriculars. So this came up a couple of times this year, and I think maybe because we're finally getting back into extracurriculars from previous two years where it was kind of hit or miss. So in district, we work at the IEP team level to think about how we can provide opportunities for our students. We have our positive behavior support plans, related services, communication devices, augmentative devices. We look at co-planning with our teams, providing one-on-one -on -one assistance during school and after. So we did have several students that took part in the play or during sporting events where we did provide an additional adult or a one-on-one -on -one aid with those students, whether it was for um, the needs of their IEP or we did have some medically fragile students. Um, we talk about finding natural and authentic ways so that students can work and play right alongside their peers, which is something we have pride in. It's also important to note that for those private institutions that are within our school district boundaries, when we are considering their ability to participate, typically what we do is we have a meeting and we have discussed with the families what their needs are and we talk about any transportation needs and what we can provide adequately for those students as well. The next section is a continuum of services. And again, the definition is just that we have a continuum of services. We have everything from special education students attending general education classes, to moving into co-taught classes, in regular ed classes with supplementary aids and services. We have learning support classes. There's an array of those. And then of course, there's alternative placements should any of those placements, any of those services not work out. With that practice, ooh, got a little excited there. With that practice, we do have to report percentages every single year. And so you'll see that on, um, average looking down to the percentages just to give you an idea of how we're doing. Currently we are at 96.2% of our students receiving special education within district programming as opposed to out at an alternative school. And only 3.8 of our students receive supports and other savings when the state average is 4.7. So we are below the state index, which means we're doing okay. And we still continue to look at those students as to who we can bring back 
in district with proper supports. Just to give you an idea in a mind's eye of where do our students go when they leave us to go to alternative schools, this is a current list of all students placed at outside institutions. So you'll see going down through there, most of our students are placed from emotional support, which is something that we've taken a good hard look at and are considering um, looking at more supports within the buildings to see if we can increase our time for students within emotional support programs or partner with other schools to be able to provide a more intensive support for those students. All right, providing supports means you have to have positive positivity and reinforcement for those students to be successful. So again, this is kind of a review, putting in those behavioral supports, looking at the responsive classroom, restorative justice, uh, positive behavior support plans. Each building has really done a yeoman's job over the last couple of years of these students coming back and creating that sense of belonging for them, that they wanna be there and getting back into the norm. So along with that, we have the support of our school counselors, our social workers. We currently have two, um, behavior consultants. We have three doctoral level psychologists, which can assist and are parts of MTSS teams at every level, as well as conducting our district evaluation processes. Our counselors are trained in suicide risk assessment and violent risk assessment. And then we have mental health screenings available at all grade levels and a SAP counselor to also assist those teams. Again, I just remind you that we also have our intensive outpatient therapy by child and family focus. All right, along with that, we have different trainings for our staff. So of course, we start with our Crisis Prevention Institute, which is our de-escalation and um, restraint training on how to hold a student appropriately so that no one gets injured in times that we need to do that. We also have the de-escalation training for those secondary aides that now that we saw them and heard from them and how beneficial that was, we'll be rolling down into the elementary levels so that those aides have the same opportunities for that training. Um, we have training and our staff conducts functional behavioral assessments to determine what behaviors are of concern and what was the antecedent for those behaviors so that they can adequately develop a positive behavior support plan. And then we also employ behavior specialists who are board certified to assist our teams to conduct observations and be active members of IEP teams again, in support of those students. Alrighty, restraint procedures. When you look at this in times of crisis, we have teams that are certified to have physical intervention. This only takes place when a student is in clear and present danger to themselves and others. Um, as part of chapter four regulations, parents must be informed if a restraint or an assist was used to help manage behaviors. And um, a meeting is typically held within an IEP team so that we can discuss those behaviors and paperwork is filed in the special education office at the administration building and then filed with the state. Just to bring your attention to it, restraints are clearly outlined in our board policy 113.2. Any questions? I know I'm rolling through this and I apologize. And it's a lot. All right. Here we have our education program profile. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because it's a lot of words and lines and numbers, but what this is, is every special education classroom, the teacher and how many students they see. So I just draw your attention to, we'll look at the first one, an elementary teacher who does learning support at Enfield Elementary School. Supplemental means they have eight students that are with them, less than 80, but more than 20% of the day as opposed to their general education classroom. And then they have students that might be popping in for check-ins or a quick um, recap for something that happened instructionally or a preview of some instructional material. And they're in there for 20% or less of their day. And so this first case manager, you can see they have 18 or eight that are supplemental and 14 that are itinerant. The goal in that last column is never to go above 1.0. So that kind of gives you an idea going down this column, this is how it's reported to the state, where our caseloads lie. I do bring your attention, however, to autistic and life skills programs. We never want to get to that 1.0 because they are more um, 
intensive to be able to provide those supports to. So those teachers are doing more hands-on in a full-time classroom and a supplemental classroom than an itinerant learning support. So it's a lot of numbers here. We go through secondary, you see the middle school listing at the top. Speech therapists also can be case managers of students that are speech only. So we have those as well. Currently in district, we have three speech, four speech therapists. Um, and then, whoop, wrong way. Here we have the high school, which kind of gives you an idea of where all of the classes are. They might even go into, no, oh, they didn't go into another page. Oh, geez, now I'm going back. All right. Within the facilities, once we get a listing of all of the teachers and all of the supports, the special ed plan then asks us to measure every classroom that this instruction is provided. So instead of showing you the entire list of every classroom and the dimensions for all of those lines that I just showed you, I'm just gonna tell you that it has to be a certain square footage for a certain number of students to be within the space. So it's 28 square feet according to PA code. We have 31 classrooms from K to 12 that are designated appropriately for this purpose. None of our classrooms fell below that percentage of square footage. If you ever wanted to see that listing, and once we get the actual plan uploaded onto our website, you can feel free to peruse. I also have it broken down by teacher and class, so if you're ever interested, please feel free to reach out. All right. We have special education support services. So this just gives you outside of the classroom teachers and principals what we have in place. So you can look down there and you can see that, you know, the director of special education, transition coordinator, so on and so forth of what we have. We have to document them if they're contracted with the district or if they're contracted outside of the district. Um, looking at all of this, it's important that we continue to grow our teachers. So not only is it important to grow gen ed teachers and for special education teachers to be a part of those literacy professional developments and all of that responsive classroom, restorative justice, but they also need their own specialized training as most professionals do. The state has asked us to focus on a handful of these professional trainings specifically for our teachers to look at over the next three years. So first, we have those working with students within autism. So some of the trainings that we have here, we're gonna be moving forward to continue to look at our intensive training that we started. You can see we have our essentials for living and everything here, some of the teachers are just going to build upon moving forward because that was an area of focus before. We then have our behavior support, which we've already reviewed. We have our paraprofessionals, and they receive their CPR and first aid training annually. We also have vector online trainings with our administrators and the special education office can assign them specific topics of professional development to attend to their needs or their student that they're working with that year. We have our de-escalation training and our crisis prevention training. And then within our parent training at present, the coffee and conversations, we've liked to bring that back as they were successful in the past as well as a parent advisory committee now that things are getting back to the norm. The last three areas of professional development fall around transition planning. As I mentioned before, we have a transition coordinator for those of you who may know her, Nicole Trage. She also oversees ESY programming. She is going to, this is a building off of what she started to do every year. So she has cyclical training. So she goes through to prepare the teachers on how to prepare that section of the IEP for those students that are 14 and older. This year, the state would like us to focus on the science of literacy. So to begin, we're gonna continue our ongoing Wilson training, which we did start in the, fall, in the spring here to make sure that people got recertified with the new program. So our reading specialist at the middle school will continue to work with aides and teachers into the fall. We also like to work with the MCIU they have worked on understanding and implementing developmental assessments and evidence-based instruction. So pulling them in to start to work with this area. Lastly, for IEP development, we have best practices. And we did start that this year. We have focus topics and transition planning. 
And of course, we have our IEP writing series that comes from the MCIU, which again is a little nuggets, little clips of professional development that we can assign to teachers based on their areas of need so that they can provide service to the students and also write a legally defensible IEP. All right, we have come to the close of my very exciting presentation. Um, this is just a snapshot of the content. Again, it's a lot of different links that you would click, which I'm hoping to have fixed tomorrow so that we can put the whole thing on the website. This plan must be on the website for 28 days. And I will put my email along with it in case anybody peruses it in their spare time over the next 28 days and would like to leave me feedback so that we can alter it. And then we would need board approval, the board president's signature, and then we would need to submit by the end of July. Any questions and all of that? Okay. I'm going to stop sharing. Leave them wanting more, Dr. Van Boren. <laughs> I would just like to say thank you for all the hard work you clearly put into this. Um, it is a lot of information, and that meant it was a lot of work to do. So thank oh, you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I did have help from some other administrators and some parents and some teachers. So it was it was a group effort, but it's uh, it's it's good stuff. It gives us a focus. Great job, Dr. Van Boren. You worked really hard on that in the middle of several other things this spring. So I can't believe you got it all done. Thanks very much. While you're still so comfortable talking, and you took that big swallow of breath, fresh breath. Uh, you want to talk about ESY for just a minute, just to provide an overview as we move into summer programs? I can, yeah. So ESY is up and coming. We have training for teachers this week. So coming in, coming in fast and furious. And these teachers are excited. So I will, I will tell you that you would think that teachers are burnt out and they don't want any more, but these teachers and aides that work the ESY program, they love it. And so to them, it's not work. And so it is truly inspiring to see because you think, oh gosh, now the kids are coming back in a week, but they start on Wednesday with their training and they're like, yeah, the kids come back in a week. And it's really low key and it's a good time. So um, we're looking forward to it. Our in-district program is gonna run from the 27th of June through um, the 28th of July. It runs Monday through Thursday and it is five hours a day located at the middle school. We also have a program for students that need more of an academic focus. So we have our reading and math program, K to eight, which will also be housed at the middle school. However, it runs Monday through Thursday and it's only nine to 11. And it's a little shorter of a time frame, So it's a four week marker instead of a five, followed by those students receiving tutoring in six through 12 or any kind of credit assistance with credit retrieval. And that is again, that is giving the entire window of the summer because it's really a one-to-one -one with a tutor and setting up those dates and getting those hours. So those are our three branches of ESY this summer. Thanks, Dr. Van Boren. I appreciate you being here this evening. Does anyone have any ESY questions? Not to be outdone, Spartan Academy is back fast and furiously. Um, while we are excited about the 241 children we're gonna serve this summer, um, in Spartan Academies, which I'll recall, as you recall, we built um, last year for the first year. Uh, this year we have uh, minimized how much we're offering in a different way. Um, last year we offered the program also to incoming kindergartners, and this year we really decided it made the most sense to serve children we were already working with um, in grades one through nine, so the rising kindergartners all the way through the rising ninth graders. So um, you can see that the most popular uh, is the Erdenheim program, grades three through five. Um, we have continued to get requests of, could you sneak my kid in up, up to including a couple of hours ago? Would you mind? Could you possibly? So wherever we can, we're trying to accommodate our families. Questions on Spartan Academy? All right, you all are hanging in there. <clears throat> Just a couple of things to look forward to when we come back together. Uh, Dr. Yannicone, Dr. Van Boren, myself and our other administrators um, have busy projects this summer, really doing some data assessment, taking a look at all um, the data that is coming pouring back into the district now that we finished our state testing, well, as well as our AP results um, and STAR assessment. So some of those are in already. 
We've gotten our preliminary PSSA data and our STAR data, but AP and Keystone we're still waiting for. So as they come in, working really with our building and district administrators to take a look at what do we know, what are we thinking, and how does that want to target and focus our energies for next year. Um, long awaited, as you know, is a revamp of our curriculum website, really trying to make it as um, easy for families to follow, providing information that's written for families to digest. So uh, my major project this summer is to really lay out that scope and sequence um, of our uh, learning for each grade level so that families can really have a good understanding of what their children will learn um, while they're in school with us. Come the fall, we um, anticipate presenting to all of you our assessment presentation like we did last year, give you a sense of where we ended the spring and how does that inform our fall goals. Um, and then Dr. Ganico, I don't know if you would like to share um, with our team here, our new addition to our academic affairs committee next year. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So um, when we were going through the interview process for the new um, student representative to the school board, we um, found a second student who was just outstanding and passionate about uh, academic programming. And she's a current ninth grader, rising 10th grader. And so I went to Dr. Johnson and said, we only have room for one student rep to the school board, but how about a student advisor to the academic affairs committee? Um, because you're, that's the committee of, the, of all the board committees that's really focused on educational, day-to-day -day educational life. Um, and she agreed and the student is thrilled. So she will be joining us at academic affairs meetings next year. And she'll also be just a, a sounding board for Dr. Johnson as she thinks about different educational options. Um, so we're excited. We're excited to, get, to increase student voice in this way. Questions or comments on our summer or fall projects? Anything you all are looking for that we're not, we haven't sort of brought up so far tonight? I don't even know if there's anything left to bring up. <laughs> I, all I wanna do is applaud everyone who has uh, put their effort and time uh, into all of these areas which are just so eloquently mapped out and planned. Uh, so just kudos to all of you. Thanks, Dr. Etlin. Mr. Wexler or Mr. Oliver, can you confirm we still don't have any public attendees this evening? That's correct. So I guess we don't have any public comment then. Dr. Allen, can I move on? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So um, we appreciate everything. Our hope is to bring us all back together in September. Um, I am confident we'll have lots to share with you. Dr. Etlin, I have shared with you minutes from this evening's meeting. It's in your inbox. Yes. Um, and have. you're good to report out tomorrow evening? Absolutely. All right. Dr. Yannicone, any final thoughts or comments for our team? No, I just want to say thank you to the members of the board. Um, I say all the time to the administrative team how supportive you are and engaged. And um, that was modeled today because we threw a lot at you tonight. And we appreciate on a really beautiful, uh, you know, night in June that you all could join us and are so engaged in the process that we're going through. So thank you. We are very lucky. So thank you very much. Thanks for such a thorough presentation. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Extremely thorough. Yes. I'm going to take thorough as a positive today. It is a positive. Thoughtful, very everything. positive. <laughs> it's a lot. We can't help. We can't help ourselves. But we we know you all have high standards for our families and for our community, and we want to make sure we've given you all the information so that you're equipped to answer those questions when they come your way. Um, and so we are grateful for your support and your encouragement and your kind words. It means more than you can ever imagine to each of us. Um, and so with that, I say have a wonderful summer. And this concludes our meeting, Dr. Etlin. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everybody. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Okay, Have a great summer. All right. August. <laughs>